Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism and the Global Journalism Seminar Series. Thank you for dialing back in, still in lockdown. Really delighted to have with us today James Harding, co-founder of Tortoise Media, former editor of Times and um, head of BBC News as well, comes from an excellent pedigree and perfectly poised to speak about the state of journalism. Tortoise began in 2018 with a mission of slow news centered around in-depth reporting, but also a kind of deep personal connection with its readers via live events and different forms of membership models. We've now gone into a year of hyperactive news, virtually no personal connections with anybody, let alone our readers, and no live events of any sort from music, theatre, journalism, everything has been online. So we've, we're, we're dealing, and yet Tortoise has come up with exceptionally good reportage on Brexit, on the coronavirus crisis, on Grenfell, on some of the biggest issues that have hit Britain. So we're really delighted to have you here with us, James, to talk through both the future of journalism and the future of tortoise. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Can I just ask you, first of all, how, how this year has gone, well, last year and this year so far are going for you at tortoise? Well, the, the, this year, even just January feels like it's been quite a long time, let alone the, the last year. Um, the, the, the truth is, I think for a lot of people, it's, it's similar in that you've got a, a lot that's difficult um, just in the management of your life and your working life. And then you have these strange tropical storms within your own day. You know, this moment of, of sense of massive frustration and then a sense of how you can do things differently and, the, and possibility. So our year looked like this. We were um, beginning to get some real momentum in January, February 2019, 2020. In fact, I remember it was almost exactly this time last year that my co-founder, Katie Vanek Smith, who's uh, obsessed with pandemics and had some Google alert that as soon as there was any sign of anything that looked like a pandemic, she got texted. And I actually, I remember we were sitting on a train and she was saying to me, I think there's something that's going on in China. Look at what's happening in Wuhan. And I was a bit, you know, cavalier about it. Within a few days or weeks, i.e. by early February, we were beginning to say something really significant is happening. The beauty of tortoise is you're not reporting the day to day. So you can begin to look at what might be happening. Even by, I think, the middle of February, we were saying, look, it looks like the Olympics is going to be off. You know, you could see this thing building. But then, like everyone, we were hit. So by the third week of March, all of the non-recurring revenue, all of the um, live events that we were doing with business partners that were providing a stream of revenue as we were building towards us, all of that got cancelled. And we wondered what we were going to do because at the heart of our newsroom, and I'll, I'm sure we'll get a chance to talk a bit about Tortoise, was this idea that we would host think-ins, we'd host open news meetings in our newsroom. And obviously all of those had to be cancelled. But it's funny, you know, when you say Mira at the start, you know, we haven't had live events for more than a year now. Weirdly, I've got so used to doing these things digitally. This is what I think a live event is now. I actually think that we're able to do things that have, frankly, a better caliber and range of people joining, a bigger diversity of people, you know, in every sense of the word, but, you know, importantly for an organization like us that's born in London, geographically, as well as everything else and so actually we found that the year just took off and to give you a sense of it we went into the uh, pandemic with about 27,000 people signed up we've now got more than 80,000 people signed up you know the better part of 60 percent of those are full paying some of those have just taken on free trial some of those have just signed up to our daily sense maker email but, you know, we're 20, 21 months into Tortoise, you know, we're not yet at two years. And so we feel like we've got some momentum and our business model, as you may know, is no advertising. So critical for us is growing that membership base and having business partners that we work with to provide thinkings for them. That's also grown really significantly. We've got a partnership base now of about 38 companies. And so you're beginning to see some momentum there. And I can't help but feeling, you know, as testing as it's been, actually the pandemic and doing things digitally has really kickstarted what we do, uh, you know, as a business, but also journalistically. 
Can I push you a little bit on that, um, especially the issue of thinkings? And I just want to say to all the attendees, welcome. But also, if you do have questions, please type them in the Q&A box on the screen and I'll put them to James as we go along. Um, the thinkings um, were core part of what you were your model, and they were this idea that the audience participate not just in consuming the story, but also generating the story so that they give ideas and they give feedback and it's an ongoing inter interactive loop. And when you started in 2018, these were in person and mostly in the UK and in London. Um, and it has changed, obviously, and it's gone online. Do you feel that has had an impact on the kind of journalism you do? Because obviously, when you're online, you have a different audience coming in to, into your events. It had, well, there are lots and lots of ways in which it had an impact. So we had, firstly, one of the things that we struggled with when we got started was being in London. Right? And being in London meant you were going to attract a certain group of people who might anyway have similar views and similar experiences. And so we created the Tortoise Network to go out and make sure that we were hosting, you know, one thinking every other week out around the country. We were doing some internationally, but as you say, mostly UK. So one of the first things that changed was that you suddenly had the capacity to reach internationally well across the UK. The second thing that changed was you saw a big change in our numbers, right? So, you know, we were across all of our events when we were in person, you know, talking to and listening from, you know, 500 or so people a week. You know, some of our best weeks last year, there was many as 10,000 people who attended a talks event. You know, there were really, really big weeks. Now, it wasn't every week like that, um, but there were, you know, you suddenly saw a big reach, a big change in that, uh, on that front. And so then there's the big question, which was then how does it change journalistically what you do and what you hear? Um, you, two, two ways. One is you can then attract a kind of different kind of person. You can say to the former Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, can you come and do this? We yeah. can open it up and a group of people can come or former Prime Minister Tony Blair. Or, you know, there's just that, that happens in terms of the guests you invite. But actually, what's also really interesting is you also hear stories from people who weigh in in the thinkings who are not necessarily going to get on a train and come to London to talk to you, but who will click on a Zoom call. And so what we started hearing also were stories that really contributed to, for example, you know, Unheard Voices. We did a big series of uh, it on the pandemic about you know, people whose stories were just going unseen and unreported, and the thinkings were absolutely critical in hearing those voices. Uh, actually, this week, one of the things we did is we made a big shift this year into audio, and one of the um, one of the elements that I think you'll hear if you listen to this week's slow newscast mm -hmm. was a series on hidden homicides on women who are killed but whose deaths go are not properly investigated or necessarily accounted for either by the police or the coroner's courts and having a thinking on that subject before you go to publication means that you you get access to voices and stories that you might otherwise not have done and and you you hear it if you listen to hidden homicides um can i just say Mira, before i um go on let me just uh respond to marcella conova who's in the chat who just said, did you say 27 people signed up before the pandemic and 80? Marcel, just so we you know exactly how we work, we're a membership organization. So we're seeking people to become our members. Prior to the uh, pandemic, we, we didn't make any of our journalism uh, free. So if you wanted to get the daily sense maker uh, email, I'm sort of in effect our daily newsletter, you had to become a member. What we did as the pandemic started was like a lot of people, we saw what the FT or the New York Times were doing and we did the same. We opened that up. So we then had a bigger group, of, we, we had a big increase in the course of the year, about 50% growth in the number of people paying. We then had a big increase in what we think of as trialists, people who say they're coming to a thinking, they sign up and, uh, and join. And then there's a big group of people who've also signed up for the newsletter. So overall, that 80,000 people includes paid trialists who are on the path to becoming paid membership and, and newsletter. I say all of that because, you know, I've been in this business for a little while now. We're, we're all learning how those things convert, how that membership grows. And we're also 
early into learning what the pandemic is going to do to churn, i.e. to people who join and then leave. And so I hope that explains what that number is. You know, if you're at the start of this, what you want to see is that all of those things are going up, which they are. What you're going to have to learn in 2021, 22 is what, is what happens to those lines. Thanks very much. Um, and any other questions, do please type them into the, the Q&A box as well. Um, I want to, you were talking about the, the hidden hidden um, voices, especially the hidden homicide story, but also diversifying voices. Could you talk a little bit more about this? Because this issue of kind of inequality in the media and diverse voices in the media is, has been an ongoing theme at the Reuters Institute, um, certainly for the last year, but long before that. And I know that you've started the Tortoise Network where a portion of the, your revenue is, um, is to donate membership fees in order to help diversify your un audience, especially outside London. Could you talk a little bit about what's happened with that? So, so yeah, Mira, I'm, I'm smiling because we had we have our uh, editorial meeting at eleven, and at the end of it, um, we had a small group together talking about exactly this subject. Funny enough, from the other end of the telescope, which is information inequality not in terms of inequality in the news business, but inequality in terms of the receipt of information. Like how do you, who, who actually gets information? And fun enough, on the call, I said, actually, you know, we should speak to the Reuters Institute. They might be able to help us, uh, you know, journalistically, because I think- Gladly. I'll, I'll come to, you know, I'll come to the, 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 the point about how do you hear from people and how do you recruit people? So you're changing the voices that are speaking in your newsroom. But, but just to stick on this for one second, I do think there is something really interesting and invigorating about what's happened this year, if you're a journalist, is it's forcing you to see things that were, that were there, not these big changes that people talk about. It's not the, oh, how is the world going to be changed? It's what's being revealed. And, you know, I think that the pandemic has revealed more than it's changed. And a lot of those things are the gaps that it's revealed, you know, East versus West, young versus old, center versus regions. But the, but the and, and the inequality debate, which goes around, uh, you know, geography, around race, around education, it should also be investigated as regards information, right? Who are the people who are getting information and what's the kind of information they're, they're getting? Uh, and, you know, I think it's really easy to get into, a, into and important to get into the debate around, you know, platforms, polarization of the media, uh, you know, all of those established issues. But that one, the structure of kind of our information um, ecology seems really important to me. Um, to get back to your point, when we started Tortoise, we started with three basic heresies. One was we were going to be slow versus fast, but all newsrooms raced to be first. The second was we weren't going to take advertising because we didn't think it would work. Right? So we had a different model, which was not reach, it was engagement. And the third was that we were going to be open rather than closed. And, and openness was directly a response to your point, which was, how do you deal with this fact that editorially we can act as an echo chamber, journalists talking to themselves, but culturally too, right? And that was the critique that was made, that was made from both left and right of newsrooms that, you know, I've worked in and that many of us on this call have worked in. Um, and so the idea of Tortoise was that the thinking would be an open news meeting. And, and what we've done as a result of that is we've started to do more and more projects where we bring in people that we hear. So, for example, although this word is really not very fashionable these days, we organised a moonshot, which was how would you get to net zero by 2030? And we recruited a bunch of people who joined us from thinkings interested in the climate crisis to go and research and write that, write that up and participate. If you look today on our slow views section, we have the tortoise equivalent of an op-ed, which is slow views. Actually, we're beginning to see participants in our student network, you know, contributing slow views. And the tortoise network itself was to take this head on, was to say, 
hang on, if you just sit and wait for people who are going to be interested in this to come to you, you're going to wait a long time. Let's go out and work with organisations, whether it was the National Citizen Service or White Hat or a uh, Maggie centers, a host of different organizations. We reached out to all of them and said, look, we'd like to be able to provide memberships to Tortoise. We're going to get companies to pay for them, right? So that, you know, it's, it's funded rather like the US model of, you know, newspapers on campuses. We're going to try to do, do that to make sure we have different voices in our thinkings and informing our journalism. And that, of course, has really grown since we moved on to something digital because you don't have to be able to come to the London newsroom to get the best of it. You're muted, Mary. I know, I just realised that, <laughs> rookie error. Um, just on the other side of it, the part you touched on at the beginning and the diversity inside the newsroom it, itself, the big first recruitment drives you had, had some of the kind of the biggest voices and biggest names in, in and respected names in British media, Chris Cook and so on, Mary P. Mills. But um, how do you feel are you, are you kind of content with the makeup of the newsroom? And if, if you'd like to hire your next wave of hires, where would you like to hire from? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, I'm not content. Um, so this is, so you put your finger on a really clearly big issue for all newsrooms. It should be less of an issue for a new one, right? It, yes. You know, having come from the BBC, you know, one of the things that you saw at the BBC was, there's a greater pressure on the BBC to, to address this issue, but there's also a greater obstacle because it's harder to move people around and, it's, and, and there are fewer places to go from the BBC. When you're a new newsroom, um, it's much harder. And at front of when we started, uh, actually we had, in diversity terms, so talking about different things. So when we think about that, we, we think about gender, race, uh, um, disability, and we are talking about how we think about socioeconomic background, right? But those, those three that starters. Actually, overall as a news organization, we're, we're, we're pretty evenly spread th through it in terms of, um, in terms of gender. We, when we started, actually we had, a, we had a better mix, not as good a mix as you'd want, in terms of race, and then what what we've seen is there's a couple of people that we that that Katie and I recruited when we started have then been poached, right? And then very quickly that changes. And so one of the things that um, we do is that we set not only do we measure it internally, but we set ourselves target for us and the whole team. What you'll see now is that we are we're not content with where we are. And then we set ourselves a target for, for us and all the partners of Tortoise to hit diversity measures for, for the year. Um, uh, so, that, so that it's not just something we, you know, we talk to ourselves about, which is the risk in all newsrooms, but something we're all you know, required and incentivized to address. And so I think it's gonna be a big issue for us. Look, I think the, you know, and if there's anyone on the call who goes, well, hey, hey I can help you fix that problem. You know, email me because it's something that we are actively uh, discussing. Fun enough, uh, I just came off a call before this about slow views, and about that as a fantastic platform for us in terms of getting a broader mix of voices um, in, in into Tortoise and as a stepping stone into, you know, full time jobs, partnerships, it, becoming partners of the uh, of, of what we're doing. So you're right to put your finger on it because it's something that is. That particular new business, we really should be able to to, um, to make sure that the next time I come on this call, I can say, yes, I am satisfied. Yes, I am content. I think it's really interesting when you're a new business because you're building up brand and reputation as well. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to go with well-established names. So people who've already built their careers and made it elsewhere. But then in doing that, you, you kind of lose an opportunity to be diverse from the very beginning sometimes because you kind of build in it's, it's, it's entrenched really, it's not it, funny enough it's it, yes that's true that, that would have been a problem if that's what had happened to that wasn't that wasn't our experience our, our experience was you know a couple of the most senior people that we had recruited were really really good one got poached back by the BBC, one got poached by, uh, by the Guardian. And my feeling is when someone comes and offers someone a really great job, 
that you know you have to say okay congratulations i think there is something which you can hear my kind of nervousness in talking about this because it the, the difficulty is the, the difficulty is if you're someone like me and you've worked in these big establishment newsrooms right the ft the times the bbc one of your issues and you're setting up something small is really the question is you've got very few hires that you can make right and so the risk for you is that you you go to the places where you know people not that you're going for big names but you go to the places you've worked in before because you know people. It's not like working in a big organization where you're like, they sound good, someone says they're good, let's give them a try. And that kind of caution means that you essentially find yourself recruiting from a pool of people where they themselves, those organizations, don't have a great mix in terms of uh, the diversity of their, their senior people in particular. It's not, the, it's not the people who are between the age of 20 and 35. And so that's the that's the issue. And the reason why Katie and I find ourselves now really working on this is how are you going to go to organizations, not necessarily even journalistic organizations, that you think that person's really good, and I'm sure they would make a real contribution to our journalism and our business. That's what we're finding we're doing. Thank you. Yeah, I think that idea of like recruiting new people, recruiting people you know is endemic to a lot of the organizations you've worked at before that you've mentioned that they themselves are realizing that this is an issue that they need to address when they recruit, they recruit from people they know. And, 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 it's, it's, but it's, but it's, and it's a weird thing because it's not, it's not what you're saying, which is, hey, let's go for the big names and then mm. they also get a pool. It's also when you go to those organizations that have the experienced people and you're saying, look, we're looking for people who've got, you know, 10, 20 years experience in journalism. They don't have those people. Right? Yeah. Not, there's a very interesting thing if you, if you look at, and one of the things that was an inspiration to me was David Astor, when he set up, when he was the editor of The Observer, had this view that you didn't need to be journalists to do journalism. Yeah. And, and I don't think that's proven one way or another. And so that's the other question is, how, who can you recruit and how can you create a culture in journalism and you'll usually address it. Yeah, it's really fascinating. Um, I'm going to stick with the question of diversity, but look at youth. There's a question from Jenny Kangasniemi, who's one of our journalist fellows from Finland, um, who's talking about um, attracting younger audiences. And I know that you're, you've had a lot of interest in your audio product from, from kind of younger audiences, but could you talk a bit more about what lessons you've learned on how to reach this audience segment and then crucially how to make them stay with you? Well, I got that really quite wrong to begin with, I have to say. Okay. Um, I thought that the audio market, I was really unclear about the audio market. We were quite nervous about it. And then actually, this is more thanks to my colleague, Kerry Thomas, who was a former editor of the Today programme, was really pushed audio. And it's been, it's been huge. The, the, two, the two separate things. One is, you know, your, your point you mentioned there about the network. We actively look to reach younger people. And so roughly a third of our members are under 30. Right? It's a really, really mm -hmm. significant thing for a news organization where, you know, if you look at the averages for the BBC, for the Times, you know, they're up in their 40s, 50s, you know, that's a that's been a big thing for us. And we've very deliberately done that. Obviously, the story selection matters in that. But audio is having a big impact. So we launched at the start of this year our SenseMaker, which was uh, a daily newsletter. We've launched as a uh, daily SenseMaker audio. It sits on Spotify. And I'm going really to get the numbers wrong, but we're seeing about 120,000 downloads a week. So we're really beginning to see, and that's, uh, and I don't have the data at my fingertips on exactly the mix of that, but all of that is part of the same drive. So I do think this question about how do you reach um, uh, younger audiences is a is one of those ones that people talk about a lot. It's it's definitely doable. There's definitely a big audience that is hungry for for news and a different kind of news. I I'd like to think that one of the things we've done this focus on the big five not being a traditional newsroom, but being focused on our planet, technology, um, you know, wealth, uh, the hundred year, uh, the, the hundred year life and new things. The, that has made a massive difference to the way in which people see us. And that I think is, uh, has, has been important. I mean, 
you've kind of talked about one of the oh, heresies. It, 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 can you forgive me? I'm just going to shut this door because. Okay. So there was a certain bit of coming in and out. So I was no just... problem. No problem. I've taken. I've sent my dog outside, which would be hmm. my. Um, you talked about the the commitment to slow news as one of the heresies you started off with, and this question from Preeti Adeli, who's again a, one of our fellows from Hungary, about this. You know, it takes real confidence and guts to say we're not going to go with any kind of breaking or fast news, and especially when you're also looking for membership. And his question is, um, how do you recruit new members without fearing, uh, without kind of offering any kind of free and fast content to drive traffic. In some newsrooms, the thinking is we need to keep some of our fast journalism in order to have a big pool of readers. And from that pool, we recruit paying members for a premium in depth, slower content. It's, it's been, you're, you're totally right to ask it because it's been really, uh, it's been temperamentally difficult rather than journalistically <laughs> difficult, right? So if you've been in that world your whole life, you know, you see what happens on Capitol Hill steps, right? right? What are we doing? And I'm making calls and you're thinking you've got to do something. And then you pause and think, well, the world's media is there in different ways. And there's nothing that we can do that we that, that's going to be better. And, and I do think that one of the things we've learned in the last year is that that one of the one of the thoughts behind Tortoise was if you looked at the if you looked at the media landscape if you looked at the news, the the crowding here around fast breaking up to the minute news right, is huge. If you look at this space right where people are doing analytical investigative uh, work, the reality is it's just not so crowded. Right. And you may say, well, of course, it's not. It's not, quote unquote, news in the same way. Yes. But if you look at the journalism that has real impact, if you look at the journalism we talk about for years to come, it's actually often the stuff that's existed in this space. Long pieces of investigation, long running campaigns, things that have taken time. And so the underpinning of what we're doing, and I need to get reined in, too, is to be reminded that if you want to do things that are worth doing, it takes time. So hidden homicides, you know, I was on a call and I remember really well the call with Louise Tickle, who's the author who's driven it and Basha Cummings, who's been the editor on it. And when they were talking about different stories and Louise said, uh, you know, there's also this thing about hidden homicides, which has been interesting to me for a while. And Basha and I were like, sorry, what's that? I don't know what that is. And then having months to go out and investigate mm -hmm. it has been absolutely key. I mean, this is kind of as a journalist, as an editor, and as a journalist, it's bloody terrifying to be given six months to go and work on a story because, you know, the expectations of what you produce at the end of that are sky high, you know, because yes. otherwise it becomes, well, what have exactly. you been working on all this time? So how, you know, how do your journalists feel about this? It's tremendous pressure, but also as editors, how do you, you can't presumably just send them away, send your writers away and say, come back to me, you must have a sense of checking and say, is this worth the investment of your time? So, our, so, so, we, so yes, there are lots of things. And, and, I, and I'd say, Mira, I don't think we've got this exactly right yet. Mm. You know, you're in the process of learning because you, you tend to work to your old patterns. But there are two elements of it that, are, that we've learned that are really important. One is when someone comes to you with an idea, a, there are a certain bunch of ideas that, you know, are just ideas. They're like, you know, we should do something on, right? That is not a, that, that's not going to work as a story, right? I've got the beginnings of a story and here's the narrative that I can see. And because it's about a bigger set of issues, that, that tends to work. But often you need a little bit of time. And so from us, a little bit of money to go and say, okay, let's spend two or three days investigating it out. Is there a there there? Right. And then what we've tended to do with some people, you know, I'll, for example, I'll give you an example. Um, Jane Martinson started looking into the Barclay brothers. That's a terrific piece. It was a really, really, really amazing piece of reporting. But it started with, let's spend a couple of days. And then there was an understanding that we had, which was, why don't you do half the work? Why don't you see whether when you get a few weeks in and we'll pay you for your time, we should call it a day. We should pull the plug on this because we can't get anywhere. There's no new reporting. We're just going to be cutting and pasting. And then when we got halfway through, actually it was really clear that Jane had a lot of interesting things to say. And so then you can commit. So part of it is about staggering the process 
pre-publication. Mm -hmm. The thing that I think we're learning is that often once you've done a big piece like this, and Chris Cook would say this to you, so one of the difficulties is that when you do the first piece, actually that's the thing that prompts the second piece, and the thing that's really good might be the fifth piece, right? And so that's what we're learning, is how do you take something once you've opened the door on a story, you know, hidden homicides is a good case, we, we've we've looked at four particular stories already this week in response to publication. We've had stories come to us of two different police forces that have real questions to answer. So how do we then pursue that? And that's what we're thinking about. And then it becomes journalism. It becomes a kind of regular day-to-day -day journalism, surely, yeah. where you, you publish something and you get responses and you want to investigate and sometimes yes. people want to respond to your story. Yeah. And that response needs to be published relatively quickly to be relevant. Um, yes. Which gets and, to me that... And that's why we've had, that's why we've we've created this slow views, a slow op-ed, is that if you've got something, that you're like, hang on, we, you know, Louise started working on Hidden Homicides, I think, in February. We really got it, in, engaged in it. We held a thinking in the autumn. We've published now in January. We know there'll be those follow-up pieces through the course of the year. Do they do they need to be a four part podcast? No. Can they be, you know, written stories or you know individual podcasts? Yes, they can. I mean, this is kind of a, there's a cluster of questions about basically what is journalism and crucially how do you differentiate slow journalism from explanatory journalism from solutions journalism? You know, where what is what would you say you would not do? Because what, what you've spoken about, the cases you've talked about really are investigations. They're kind of pulling out unknown facts and it's kind of good, it's kind of old fashioned shoe leather reporting in many ways. But is there a space that taught us, do you think, for a kind of different type of explanatory journalism? I know again, Chris Cook has done some of it around the Brexit reporting, you know, kind of going to the real step by step, how did we get to where we are kind of reporting. So, so I think, the way I think about what we do is that we we produce really three uh, kinds of journalism within Tortoise, right? Mm -hmm. I remember Nicola Gill, who was uh, the editor of the Saturday magazine at the Times when I was there. Uh, when I started Tortoise, she was like, yeah, yeah, no, no, I know you've got a big speech about it, but what's it like? <laughs> so and I said, what do you mean, what's it like? It was like, you know, everything's like something. So what's your thing like? <laughs> And I think that we've got three, three things that we're trying to do, right? So we've got the Daily Sense Maker, which is like a daily version of The Economist. It's a, it's a, here are the things that are driving the news, they're not breaking news, and we've identified them because we think they matter, right? And, and we've got a, uh, an angle or take or point of view on them. Then we've got slow views, which, you know, this is, we're a very new organization. So there's a risk that I'm overreaching because The Economist is amazing. And, and you, know, we, you know, we admire from a distance the Atlantic. We know we're near there yet, but we want that kind of caliber of kind of informed, considered opinion. And then our slow newscast, our tortoise files are big stories where if you like, what we're trying to do is, is set up uh, the equivalent of a kind of, independent TV company for news, where you find a story that tells you something big about bigger, uh, bigger issues. And so our slow newscasts are one big story. So for example, either you take in the case of this week, a long running investigation. Last week, we took one item in the news, which was the letter signed by all 10 living defense secretaries to the Washington Post, and said, what was the extent to which this was a coup, more than a, a insurrection or protest? And likewise, we might, you know, one of the things that you know Matt Dancona has done is he's done his audio essays, which take one thing, right? So we took October the 31st, Halloween, as a as a kind of snapshot in government. We took Boris Johnson's illness as a way of understanding what's happening. So that's the kind of journalism we're trying to do. I mean, we say slow and open. That's the kind of operating theory. Thank you uh, very much. Um, can I just talk a little bit about the, you, you talked about the sponsored events, the, the kind of ones where you had sponsorship from Santander Edelman. Could you talk right. a little bit how this fits into your editorial product? And then also why, do, you know, question from Tor Christopherson in Norway, so why do you think you've managed to attract these sponsors? What, what, what are they coming to you for? So we are, so, so 
the, the, the answers we're learning, like some things we thought were the case to begin with, uh, is pretty different. So going back to the, just going back to the right, right at the beginning, Mira, is look, I remember when we were setting up Tortoise walking down Baker Street, and I remember thinking, oh, this is okay, you know, we're starting a news company and it's a bit like opening a restaurant and people open restaurants all the time. And then I realized the problem, of course, in the restaurant business, there are clear operating models that work, right? You know what they are. In our business, as we all know, every single operating model either just simply doesn't work or is really seriously challenged. So our starting point was there are two problems with an advertising-based model. One was that uh, you, the advertising was in decline. And the second was that as soon as you got into advertising, you were just going to have to produce so much inventory, so much journalism, so you would have enough uh, to advertise against that you wouldn't be able to do anything that was slow news. So we then try to work out what's our business model. The thinking was, in the end, we'll live or die by growing our membership. But, but everyone told me it just takes time. Right? It, you've got to accept that it's going to take years. Mm -hmm. So then you had a question, which is even if you raise your investment money, how do you make sure you protect that and you bring money in? If it's not advertising, our thinking was, and this was where Katie Vanek Smith, my co-founder, has just been the heart of what we've done. You know, when she was the Wall Street Journal, she was the president of Dow Jones. One of the things that she did there was really build up the Wall Street Journal CEO council business. And, you know, what I think those companies come to us for is one of three things. They come to host uh, to, to host um, uh, people thinking, what we call thinking, which are which are often shared by a journalist inside a company talking about the things that are on the company's mind. So that might be anything from you know the mental health issues and the strains of working from home to you know the sustainability agenda or corporate strategy. And the reason they want to talk about those things and have a journalistic organization in there is the same reason that you know these organizations want to have ted in there you know having someone external to come in and and sort of prompt those conversations really counts and then also there are those conversations that they do that, that we do with them where they're saying actually you know what we believe in that and we're going to be sponsors of public thinking so we run these tortoise summits so for example we had the future of health we're going to do one on the future of cars the future of money and you can imagine organizations want to participate be alongside that you know scottish widows was the sponsor for um uh, the partner sorry for the the one that we held on the future of health and they want to be involved in that conversation because they've got an interest in it so i think that's the reason um and, and what we're learning is that there really is an appetite as i say not for reach other media organizations can do that but for engagement i mean you're not the only media organization to do that. And the FT has done something very similar with kind of the FT conferences and live events. But was there any unease or questions raised from your editorial staff and were there concerns raised about how this is going to affect the editorial line? There's unease. The, the, you're the, too the, small to have Chinese walls, essentially. Difficult, exactly. <laughs> well, no, no, it's, it's actually, you can have Chinese walls. The, the difficulty is, right? So yes, there's, there's unease in every direction, you know, and, and that unease is really healthy and really necessary. So the unease, um, you know, I, I worked in organizations that were, every funding model has its issues, right? We've got to be really honest about it. So one of the things that I saw in newspapers was the, the unseen relationship between advertisers and the publisher, right? And the ability for advertisers to put pressure on publishers, and the, the this is this is largely unseen, underreported, but that but that exists too. You've obviously got when I my last job, the BBC. You don't have any advertisers, but you've got public funding, and then you have a world of political pressures, right? Which is self evident. The BBC. So every funding model has that that issue. The funding model in ours is going to be two things. One is do do companies uh, think that they've got a right to influence or exert pressure on our editorial line? And one of the things that we said in every conversation we had with the company, right, 
Um, and actually, we say on our website and make really clear is we're a journalistic organization. If we ever have to choose, make a choice between the story and the relationship, we'll choose the story. Right? And so it's really clear. And then there's a second discomfort, which is journalists who think, well, actually, I don't like the behavior of that company. Right? Are there things about that business I don't like? And the principle that we've applied is that, you know, the, the partners at Tortoise discuss each of those uh, um, uh, corporate relationships. And if there is an issue there, uh, it's decided in that forum, in that group. So, we, we you, you know, the, the reason I'm giving you a long answer, Mira, is that it's, it's definitely something we thought about and think about a lot, both internally and with those businesses. I mean, I would... Could you just explain who the partners are? Because I think there's lots of people who do know, but quite a lot of people who might know the kind of editorial structure of how okay, like, so, it works. Right. So here's the so right, here's the here's the here's who we are. We are my uh, chairman is uh, Matthew Barson, who is so he was the former US ambassador based in the US, and now based back in the US. Um, CC Kurzman is on the board, Katie Vanek Smith uh, and I are the co-founders. And then one of the things we tried to do in setting it up was create a situation where we could recruit editors and uh, marketeers, designers, technologists, people who would all contribute to the making of our journalism. And those most senior ones came in as partners, partners uh, in the business, uh, which means that they have, uh, they, they participate in the shareholding and the equity of the company, but also in a, in a range of decisions. So for example, how many do you, you have? Know, uh, I think we're now 14 partners. One four. Yeah, yeah. one four. Yeah. So that's kind of the the council of elders. In, so <laughs> yeah. Some of them are, I've got to get that number right. Let me double check just to check. But yeah, I think that's right. Okay. But it's, um, it's just over a dozen. Yes, because some moved and some were trying. And, and yeah, that's right. So it's, <laughs> Yeah, it's and it's a um, look, and it's a it, it, part of it was also cultural. I think Katie and I, as co-founders, were thinking, you know, what would be really good would be if we didn't create some of the cultural divisions that have existed in news organisations before, particularly if you're trying to grow something new. And I, I ask this because trust is a kind of absolutely crucial currency for all media organisations, but particularly for ones who are um, developing membership models, and it's kind of very direct relationship with the journalists, with the readers. And just a question from Margaret Hughes here, which is um, in the post-Trump era, what opportunities do you think exist to reframe what news and journalism are for a very skeptical audience whose trust is at a very low levels? And do you find what, have you done any kind of research into your, your readers, your members and trust and how much they trust you compared to how much they trust the media, for example? So, so, so no, we haven't done that work. I'm sure everyone mm. took a look at the latest Edelman yeah. trust barometer and and the decline in trust for established media and and journalists. You know, it's hard to it's hard to make a read on that. You're seeing much higher levels of consumption of news, much higher levels than ever before of people willing to pay. I subscribe to news organisations, um, uh, become uh, members of organizations like ours. So I think that I'm more worried about this point I made to you earlier on, Mira, about information inequality, right? About the fact that there's a group of people who really trust and really engage in their news and a group, large group of people who drop out and what happens in, uh, as a result of that gap. But, you know, to the, to, the, to the point of the question, Trump and trust, I do think there is uh, a real opportunity now for us to take the argument that frankly has been kind of bouncing off the walls inside mm -hmm. places like the Reuters Institute for a decade, which is how do we apply principles of public interest, principles of public service broadcasting to the digital platforms? How do the, how do the laws of free speech apply to the online world? And it feels to me as though as sort of frightening and depressing as January the 6th was, it was also a spur to democracies everywhere to say, right, let's get to grips with this. Yeah, I mean, this is this is the big question to which there's no, no kind of simple answer. But yeah, 
Thank you. I'm, I'm looking here at questions from Nick, which are kind of pulling us back to where the money is. But could you talk uh, from Nick Newman? Um, yes. Could you talk a little bit about the business side? Um, currently, how far from profitability are you? And how does the revenue stack up in terms of events, membership, sponsorship? And then on a higher level, how is your thinking changing on how to make this sustainable? And in particular, also, um, you're doing a lot more on audio. And where does that fit into this? Okay. Can we have so, your business plan? But this is really unfair because people like me read the work that Nick Newman does, and we 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 probably craft a good deal of our <laughs> business plan on, on the back of what he thinks. So this is really pretty circular. When I'm saying to him, "Here's how I think," but we want um, to know if it's working. I, I think. Look, I think that I, I'm a I'm a journalist, so I'm skeptical, and I'm an entrepreneur, so I'm paranoid. Right? So I and if you it's January 2021. You know, I strongly feel that we're in danger of being overconfident about the exit from the pandemic. Right? I'm one of those people who believes in a very buoyant 2020s. I think there's going to be a big recovery in the economy, but I just don't know when that is. I don't know whether that's second half of 2021 or second half of 2022. So, you know, Nick, to, to be to be clear, 2020 went like this. I don't know whether you joined at the beginning of the call, but we saw a real challenge to our business model in March as a whole bunch of live thinkings and events disappeared. That was important in revenue. We then saw, as I said, a big pickup in people signing up, a big pickup in uh, paid members, and a sudden take up from new companies joining who wanted us to do events with them digitally, so clearly in a lower price point in the, than in person, but that was a really big driver. That said, what was also really clear to us was that, you know, we were in for this for a long time. And so we started scaling back on costs and, and took a, made, made real reductions in our overall costs in the middle of 2020. And we're very cautious now in 2021, right? Because, you know, this is the fourth week of January. It's really hard to see and it's and it's hard to see on the two critical measures for us which is individuals willingness to pay right how's that going to play out and then you know how corporates are going to engage uh, in the world so and there's not an easy proxy for us you know in some ways if you look at other parts of the media they can see trends happening in advertising and they can see whether they're above or below that trend line you know we're a new business starting starting new um, but our, you know, our aim is, um, you know, we, we, you know, we, we set ourselves up to become a sustainable business, you know, to make sure that we're getting ourselves in the black and we're still on the, you know, on the path that we set ourselves. Thank you very much. And kind of difficult question to throw at you. Um, on that and kind of look, going back to the idea of events, you, you've done online and you've done real life events. Are you looking at a kind of hybrid model going forward? This not really, Mira. I mean, we talk, we've talked about it a bit. Yeah. The, the, thing that we, the thing that we haven't worked out, and we tried it, by the way, before the pandemic, we, did, we, we started doing sort of things above pubs where we'd have a dozen people in the room and then other people were dialing in. You, the thing that you couldn't create was a sense of fairness between the person in the room and a person on the screen. And the thing that I really think is amazing about you know, digital conversations like these is we're all in the same size box. Yes. Right? Much more, it is much more democratic. Um, you know, we don't have, when we do our thinking sort of slightly differently to this, we don't tend to, I mean, we, we don't tend to operate mostly on the sort of webinar function. We have everyone in, you can see them, they can see you, you can interact with them more directly. And you know, there are risks in that, of course, you know, we've got, we've got Zoom bombed, you know, we had those problems early on, pretty grim, I've got to say, yeah. um, people are really nasty, but, um, but you learn some things about it too, and the upside is enormous, because the upside is you really get to speak, like I was looking at the attendees, one of the attendees here, I'm going to embarrass him, is a guy called Daniel Dipper, who I think has just started at Oxford, and, you know, he's come to a few thinking, so I've got to hear him, we've never met, um, except digitally, but you do get to create relationships with people. And I didn't think that was possible. Um, I was quite old fashioned in thinking, you know, creating the relationships, you know, not just in members, but, you know, as sources, who knew that you could do that digitally? 
We've had exactly the same conversation here about these journalism seminars, which are always in Oxford at Green Templeton College on a Wednesday afternoon, and it's been extraordinary to see how you kind of have these have these live. Um, we're going to run out of time quite soon. We'll just ask a few more questions, if that's okay with you. Um, one from Catherine Pope, who's a new Tortoise subscriber and fan, and she says, I like how your approach forces me out of my bubble and comfort zone. For example, if you told me I'd be interested in something Anne Widdicombe had to say in migration policy, I'd have said no, but Tortoise got me to listen and engage. In, with that, in that spirit, does the team have a line that you won't cross, people you won't give the oxygen of publicity to, people you will not invite in? And if so, where is that line? And again, how is it divide, decided? So this is, so, so the reality of all of these things is that you can set yourself rules, but they're judgment calls, aren't they? Yeah. Um, to be honest with you, our risk has been so far more in the group think than the no platforming, right? Okay. The, 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 the greater risk is that you get lots of people together who sort of think similar things, right? And so actually making sure, you know, we commissioned a piece last week on Wednesday, um, which was what Donald Trump got right, right? Partly because we knew so many people had signed up because they passionately didn't agree with Donald Trump. How are you going to hear those counter counter views? Um, and the risk, you know, Catherine's right, is that you you then start going for people who are kind of pointlessly shrill or worse, right? And we don't. And the advantage is that you know people are invited into our newsroom, so we can make that invitation. But I know exactly what she's pushing at, which is, do you do you have certain principles around? people that you won't accept and and I think there are partners for example business partners there are three or four companies that we've just come to the conclusion we can't work with and there'll be people that we won't want to have in the the, the bigger issue actually is and I imagine this you deal with this mirror at um, uh, Oxford is a, a kind of culture which is about no platforming I I won't come on I won't participate in your event if so and so's participating, right? And that I do have a much bigger problem with because, for example, we did a, I mean, to be honest, direct about it, we had a thinking about um, trans and the Tavistock last week. And there are, there was, there was, you know, there, there are some people who say, look, I'm not prepared to speak if that person speaks. And what I try to say is, look, we set up Tortoise with a very clear idea which was the thinking was going to be the place for civilized disagreement. It was going to be the place where you would get the Israelis and the Palestinians in and in listening to both sides, you would come to a better informed point of view. But you can't have that if in effect one side is saying, well, we're not having that side in and the other way around. So that, that's, that's, sorry, that's an involved answer, which is to say it's a real issue, um, but it's not a kind of easy, uh, it's not something that we stip stipulate and we've got a little book we open and say this is here are the rules how has your membership reacted to that have you had people writing in saying i'm going to cancel my membership because you spoke to this yes. person or you covered this yes <laughs> yes i think so but i think that you're uh, and what we try to do i mean one of the things that you know katie and i tried to do when we were thinking about what would be different about tortoise was we tried to say look we're going to try to have a welcoming newsroom Right, which is not a word you would necessarily associate with, associate with a newsroom, or as it works in, even if you work there, let alone if you don't work there. And by that we meant either in person or personally, we would respond to people. And so of course we have people who really don't like what we do, don't like the way we've done it. We try to respond personally, and sometimes they agree, sometimes they, they don't, but you're gonna get some of that. The, the kind of more positive question related to that is Simon Francis, which is, where do you see most of your membership conversion taking place? Is it the kind of the content format, having a notable thinking speaker or topics of particular interest, audio? Where so that, it's a really, really good question. Yeah. It's a really good question. The answer is in all three. We mm -hmm. see we see a lot of people converting when they book into a thinking, when they actually participate. Because, you know, the thing that we're trying to do is create something like TED but for journalism, where you think, OK, this is a chance where not only can I uh, engage in, in depth in what's happening in the news, but I can participate. I can actually bring my experience. And we think that in that we have got or would like to build something that is different. So that's been one. We, we are beginning to see more and more people who are just who are converting on the back of sharing those slow views, those stories and thinking, actually, I really want to, to get all of that. 
Um, and then the big question is how conversion works, you know, to uh, be honest, Simon, that we're trying to understand is how can view of good version works from podcasting, from slow news? And we get some of it because people just like the journalism we're doing and they want to support it. But that's but but I think a lot of people who've been thinking about this, and I'm being, I'm sure people at Reuters Institute are trying to think about what's the model for investigative journalism, analytical journalism yeah. in the audio space. That's a big question. I mean, that, that's the kind of question from Bermet from Kyrgyzstan. Uh, which, what advice would you give to daily news reporters who want to slow down and do more in-depth journalism? Like, how do they convince their editors? And also, what you know, where do they start? And also, are there any big regrets of stories you've not been able to cover because of your slow news model? And imagine there are times when your, your reporters have been champing at the bit to get at something, and you've had to say, no, that's not what we do. Well... Okay, so firstly, on the just to say, on the, if you're if you're working in a newsroom and you're on a daily newsroom, I, I was converted to slow news by by daily reporters, not by kind of editors, you know, stroking their wise chins. It was daily reporters saying, "Hey, listen, I, you know, when I was at the Times, we investigated child sex grooming at Rotherham and Rochdale, and there was a person there called Andrew Norfolk, who did the reporting, reporter on a daily beat, who just." saw the story and realized it was just going to take an enormous amount of time to get to it and that was the that was the work that really stood out and so my conversion to the belief that you know breaking news is invaluable i'm not saying it's not but to having some more resource around taking time to investigate stories actually came from the frontline of reporting and weirdly the, one of the things you really need is beat reporters who say i keep on coming up against the same story something bigger is happening here and so I really, uh, uh, I really do believe in that. Um, sorry, what was the second question, Mira? Forgive me. Are there any, no, are, there any, are, there any are there any regrets? Are there stories that you well, wish you'd been able to cover? So I tell you one of the things that's weird about it is that part of the thing we're doing culturally is not trying to add to the noise, right? Not trying to be a newsroom that's like going, oh, you know, Big, big font, big, you know, uh, uh, blaring announcements. And actually by being slower, what we found is we will sometimes be way ahead of the story because you can see where things are going. You just can't tell exactly when they're, when they're going to get there. You know, I mentioned the Olympics earlier on. We were reporting that way before it was announced because you could just see what was, see what was coming. In terms of reacting to the breaking news, I said, it's more temperamental than things, you know, there are definitely gonna be sometimes stories where we think, oh, we've commissioned something and we didn't get there before it broke. Um, but it's really, it's. It, I worried about this before I started yeah. thinking, oh God, what happens if we worked on something for six months and then tell us someone else does it? And they just tweeted it out. Yeah, it's happened, yeah, they tweeted it out, exactly. It's happened, but not in a way that, I, not in a way that I found myself howling at the moon. Okay. I mean, I, I want to know, when did it happen? <laughs> That's what I think it's good. Um, I'm trying to remember a good example of, you know, we've committed, we've committed for examples to investigations mm. and, you know, for example, I'll give you a good example. We tried to do a big investigation into Belarus, right? What was happening there and what was going on in uh, Poland around it. We, we just, a, a, someone else did a brilliant job, right? And then B, we couldn't travel, right? So it was like, okay, well, these things happen, you know? Um, but it's not been, uh, and also to a certain extent, the nature of the, because the way we're trying to do our journalism, which is be open and show people our working, even when those stories do happen, we try to do them in a different way. This is, I'm very nervous having this uh, conversation with you, Mira, because now I know all the things that we're commissioning for the next three, three six months, <laughs> they're all going to blow up in my face. But yeah, that's... We'll keep an eye out. I mean, my fi final question, you, like you said, you've, you've come from a tremendous pedigree from, you know, some of the biggest media organisations in the UK. Have you found that your the presence and the arrival of Tortoise has changed the landscape in any way? Have any of your traditional competitors, other media organisations, copied your approach? Is there a different thinking towards journalism? I think we, look, I think there have been quite a lot of people doing things that are similar. You know, that we were really... 
I, I remember I remember when I very first started, I worked with an old colleague of mine for the Times. And he said, I don't understand what you're thinking, leaving the BBC to go and set up your own thing. You know, you're going to find yourself dancing around the kitchen when one of your tiny stories gets picked up on the Today programme. And at the moment, you're in charge of the Today programme. And, um, and I remember laughing because, you know, a fair few months later, I was dancing around the kitchen when the Today <laughs> programme picked up a story. And, you know, the very first story we did when we launched in April 2019 was about opioids and opioid use in the UK and then I saw the Sunday Times just picked up and ran with it and actually that turns out to be really rewarding actually not seeing the kind of echo chamber of the media as a problem seeing it as something that you can work with has been really good we've definitely seen I think a lot of interest in this idea of how do you do more open journalism and we've seen lots of people talking more about slow journalism which I think can only be uh, a good thing um, but the reality is the, the demands of news, and not least, you know, uh, the demands of this past news year mean that most news organisations are doing what they do. They've also got the business models they've got. So we haven't found that. What we get, which is really encouraging, and I should say I've been really grateful for, and I should also say, Mira, I'm grateful to Reuters Institute for, is when you leave those big organisations, as a journalist, you think, oh my God, is anyone going to pick up the phone? Are you just going to be alone? Sort of effect sitting talking to yourself in a cupboard <laughs> actually what you find is there's a world of amazing kind of enterprise in journalism people trying new things and what I didn't expect was the willingness of people to help you or suggest new ways of doing things both in the UK but internationally and that's been amazing so you do feel like you've stepped off some very big ship but into a flotilla of these little boats I'm not really a sailor so I'm not going to go much <laughs> further with this metaphor but that's the that that's that's been really rewarding that's a lovely metaphor. James, thank you so much. We're we're out of time, but it's been an amazing hour's discussion and Tortoise is doing incredible work and we wish you every success and thanks everyone for participating as well. And do have a look at Tortoise, kind of go and look. They, they produce a lot of tremendous investigations, a lot of tremendous innovation that's worth, worth keeping an eye on. Thank you, James. Don't just, mirror, don't just firstly mirror, don't just look, because, sign up, become a member. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, you can. I'm james at tortoisemedia.com. And Mira, a big thank you to you. It's really been a pleasure to talk. Thanks very much, James. Thanks, everyone.